Sometimes, events unfold too quickly. While there may be signs, we may not fully anticipate the wave that is about to come crashing over us. A few days later, the virus reached Latin America. Again, events unfolded quickly. These are times of huge uncertainty for Chile. The crisis has an impact on all of us. There is little time to react and information is scarce. The problem is complex and demands a comprehensive reaction. Science, operations research and analytics have a crucial role to play. This is how the collaboration between the Chilean government and the Complex Engineering Systems Institute, ESI, was born. My name is Leonardo Vaso. I am the director of the Institute Complex Engineering Systems, a multi-university center devoted to research, innovation, and societal impact. I am proud and thankful to introduce Chile's application to the Franz Edelman Award. In this presentation, we will show how an early partnership between the Chilean Ministries of Health and Science, and tell the largest telecom company in the country and the Institute, developed innovative methodologies and tools that placed OR and analytics at the forefront of the battle against the COVID-19 pandemic. This provided guidance for several key decisions in each of the three pillars of the Chilean strategy against the virus. Contagion prevention, nationwide centralized management of critical beds, and vaccination. Specifically, and as the pandemic progressed, we used advanced methods from statistics, machine learning, and operations research too. First, shed light on the actual effects of lockdowns in different municipalities and over time. Second, help allocate limited intensive care capacity. Third, significantly increase the testing capacity and provide on-the-ground strategies for active screening of asymptomatic cases. And fourth, implement a nationwide serology surveillance program that significantly influenced Chile's and the world decision regarding vaccine booster doses. We will also show that this project is probably unlike others you may have seen in the past as it faced important challenges. Urgency, given the fierce progression of the pandemic, coordination at the national scale of large and diverse teams, and nurturing trust in an anguished population through effective communication. As we mourn our dead and our thoughts go to so many that lost someone, we will show you how this partnership between government, academia, and the private sector used OR to contribute to curb this crisis. We will show how analytics saved lives in Chile. Uh, my name is Andres Kuv. I'm the Minister of Science, Technology, Knowledge and Innovation from Chile. I am a scientist. I was trained in neuroscience and I worked most of my life in academia. In a very critical moment, the alliances established by the Institute, the private sector and the government 
were essential to tackle this very complex challenge. Each one provided different capacities, each one provided different talents, uh, each one provided a different uh, point of view uh, to tackle this uh, very difficult uh, challenge and especially at a very critical moment. As a new Ministry of Science, we have the role of coordinating and articulating the scientific community. An excellent example of how the scientific community contributed to the pandemic is also provided by applied engineering, which is directly linked to the work of the Institute. One of them is their studies on mobility, which helped us understand the behavior of the population during lockdowns. This was completely unknown before the pandemic, and now we understand the advantages and also the limitations of lockdowns. Another project, the uh, serology surveillance, provided critical evidence for a boosted dose in our vaccination strategy. During a time when uh, we didn't know if we needed or if we didn't need a booster, the surveillance of the serology provided critical evidence in favor of having a third dose for the vaccination strategy. Governments mandated school closures and localized lockdowns begin at the end of March. In Santiago, these lockdowns affected, initially, mostly high-income areas where cases were concentrated. Lockdowns were effective in reducing outbreaks in these areas, but cases were growing quickly in lower-income areas. Lockdowns shifted accordingly to lower-income neighborhoods, but with little effect in containing outbreaks as cases continued to grow in these areas. A citywide lockdown began mid-May, lasting several months. During the first wave of 2020, we saw a large disparity in the effectiveness of lockdowns across regions, even within the same city. Seeing this, it became clear that we needed indicators, other than new cases, to quickly evaluate the effectiveness of the lockdowns, because waiting to observe the evolution of cases proved to be too late to contain outbreaks. This is when we had the idea of using mobility data to anticipate infection outbreaks. Following the logic of an epidemiological compartment model, mobility is a proxy of the rate of transmission in the community. We first thought of using the mobility reports constructed by Google, but these were not sufficiently granular to monitor mobility at the level that the lockdowns were being implemented. Also, they provided information about movements within a given area, but not between areas, which we thought were likely to explain the spread of outbreaks and were more relevant for assessing the efficiency of the lockdowns. This led to the collaboration with Antel Ocean, part of the Chilean telecom company Antel, to construct mobility indicators at a more granular level based on the usage of telecom infrastructure. Mi nombre es Antonio Moreno y soy gerente de Entel Ocean, la unidad de negocios digitales de Entel, la empresa de telecomunicaciones más grande de Chile. En Entel siempre hemos creído que la forma de resolver los grandes desafíos o innovaciones es mediante alianzas público-privadas. Por eso, en un proceso de búsqueda de alianzas, nos acercamos a la Universidad de Chile. Y durante ese proceso, se nos acercó también el Instituto de Sistemas Complejos de Ingeniería y el Ministerio de Ciencia, Innovación, Tecnología y Conocimiento para que, en conjunto, ayudáramos a resolver el gran desafío de entender la movilidad durante la pandemia. El resultado alcanzado nos permitió transformar data de la red móvil, anonimizada y agrupada, en un visor territorial que nos permitía entender la movilidad durante las cuarentenas, mediante una plataforma digital abierta. Esta fue la iniciativa base que posteriormente nos permitió construir iniciativas adicionales con el Ministerio de Ciencia y el Ministerio de Salud. We developed an innovative approach to infer the patterns of mobility within a city using telecom data. First, we identified a household for each device based on georeference connections during nighttime. Then, we mapped movements of each device during different working hours to construct an origin-destination matrix across municipalities, providing detailed information on the compliance to lockdowns in each local area. To ensure the privacy of the users, we implemented data aggregation and anonymization techniques, which were essential to provide transparency of this information to the population. These novel mobility indicators were made publicly available through an online platform 
updated weekly, which gained huge visibility in the media. We also worked to provide scientific evidence to show that the reductions in mobility were indeed associated with reductions in cases, developing an econometric model that showed the causal impact of mobility on infections. Under conservative estimates, this increased adherence to lockdowns reduced infections by nearly 13,000 cases, leading to 550 fewer ICU hospitalizations and 370 fewer deaths. In addition, this data revealed that complying with social distancing was much more challenging for low-income families, which led the government to provide focalized aid through the distribution of food and financial support. The mobility platform was expanded to include other major cities in Chile and trips between these cities. Altogether, the information provided by this nationwide mobility platform became a useful tool for the health authorities to plan the localized lockdown strategy used in Chile. El aporte de ICI vino en un momento muy importante. Era cuando estábamos trabajando con cuarentenas, las cuarentenas móviles, viendo cierto eh, cómo separábamos una comuna donde se estaban viendo mayores casos o no. Y cuando los investigadores de la Universidad de Chile nos dicen que ellos tienen un dato importante, como es el dato de la movilidad que pueden aportar, a nosotros eso fue, digamos, magnífico en ese minuto porque incorporamos un dato nuevo que era cierto si estas cuarentenas estaban siendo efectivas o no. Por lo tanto, yo creo que efectivamente fue un trabajo muy enriquecedor y que aportó a las decisiones de las autoridades y de las, digamos, de cómo se fueron desarrollando las políticas públicas en el país en esta pandemia. Lockdowns were a quick response to a highly uncertain scenario. They helped mitigate the spread of infections, yet, in early May 2020, the rate of infections began to rise rapidly, pushing the health services to the limit as they battled to accommodate all incoming COVID-19 cases. Rapidly, the Ministry of Health seized control of all ICU beds nationwide, coordinating the public and private hospitals as one centralized system. At all times, the Ministry pushed for the addition of more ICU capacity and implemented the inter-regional transportation of patients from more congested cities to less congested ones. All these decisions required a detailed forecast of how many beds were going to be required in the near future for each region in the country. By the middle of May, we had a worrisome occupation rate of ICU beds of more than 95% in the capital city of Santiago, where most of the cases were concentrated. Suddenly, ICU capacity planning became a first-order concern. On May the 12th, we were urged to prepare short-term forecasts of the ICU bed occupancy for those regions with the highest utilization rates. Within 24 hours, we submitted our first report. From then on, we continuously refined the methodology and prepared forecasts every two days during the whole duration of the hospital crisis. The forecasts were based on compartment models, where patients stochastically evolve through different states. In each region, we describe the behavior of the ICU process by balancing inbound and outbound flows of patients in three different states the number of infectious individuals who show symptoms of COVID-19, the number of critically ill people who needed an ICU bed, and the number of individuals who were discharged from the ICU. To estimate the transitions, we consider the likelihood that a given patient evolved to another state and a probability distribution for the duration of each transition. Our models consider that these events depend on the characteristic of the patients and the duration of each process can be very heterogeneous, with some patients requiring ICU for several weeks. To use these models, we require precise estimation of the relevant epidemiological and clinical parameters, which for the specific case of COVID-19 could change rapidly over time. For instance, the system for generating the data were under constant stress, and therefore the information that we have available could be lacked. Similarly, because SARS-CoV-2 was a new virus, it involved continuous learning by medical teams. According to the Chilean Society of Intensive Medicine, 
As the pandemic evolved, they intubated less and they better selected the most serious patients. This implied longer durations for the stay in ICU. To accommodate all these short variations in the process, we ensemble the compartment model with a variety of autoregressive and machine learning models that have the flexibility to capture these complex dynamics. During the most critical times of the pandemic, we produced 56 ICU reports with intuitive graphic summaries tailored for a quick evaluation by the officials in charge of decision-making. Our numerical analysis indicates that, compared to a variety of benchmarks, our forecast produced the most accurate predictions, achieving average forecasting errors for four and 9% for one and two week horizon respectively. The precision of the forecast was important. On one hand, underestimation of beds could leave patients without critical treatment. On the other hand, an overestimation of bed was very costly, not only because of the limited availability of ventilators, but also because it implied the reconversion of equipment that was needed to respond to other medical requirements. Our forecasting system helped the Ministry of Health to implement a progressive increase in the number of beds, resulting in more than doubling the capacity in the most congested regions. An estimation of the impact of this effort showed that it led to approximately 850 fewer deaths. By August 2020, the requirement of ICU beds had decreased significantly and people started to partially resume their activities. People were on the move once again. In order to keep infections at bay, it was urgent to test more and to be more effective in the early detection of outbreaks. But how could more people be tested if the nation's entire lab capacity was already at the service of the fight against the pandemic? The answer came in the form of good old-fashioned analytics, an 80-year-old technique known as group or pool testing. The idea behind the technique is quite elegant. You combine samples from a group of individuals and test using a single PCR reaction. If the result is negative, everyone is clear. Otherwise, you test everyone individually. When positivity rates are low, a negative result is much more likely, which effectively increases the testing capacity. And that was precisely the situation in Chile by the end of the first wave. So this presented a huge opportunity. Going from theory to practice took a few steps. First, the technique was validated for COVID at the lab level by our partners at the Faculty of Medicine of the University of Chile. Then, we piloted a testing monitoring program at long-term care facilities. The pilot was a huge success. It showed that our version of the technique was effective at diagnosing people at a much lower cost. So it was adopted as a national strategy. In terms of impact, group testing accounted for about 20% of the total tests in Chile between September 2020 and January 2022. This accounted for over a 50% increase in testing capacity or about 3 million more tests. Just in terms of money, this translated into about $90 million in savings. Late in the second half of 2020, PCR positivity finally dropped to levels where testing requirement for contact tracing of symptomatic cases was below capacity. Until that point, the country was on the defensive. Now it was time to switch to offense and actively start searching for cases. But how and where, as lockdowns were progressively lifted and also less effective? People were on the move again. If asymptomatic cases were to be found, the search had to take place in public spaces. By the second half of 2020, testing efforts focused in identifying asymptomatic cases. And for that, the government strategy involved placing mobile PCR testing stations in public spaces throughout the cities. We developed a system to help efficiently locate in these stations by combining mobility and epidemiological data at a census block level. The system was built around an active screening index called the BAC index that estimates the likelihood of finding asymptomatic cases in some public space at any given time. Following the logic of a compartmental model, the index of a census block is computed by weighting the positivity of people coming from different census blocks and the relative intensity of that inflow. The back index 
was updated on a weekly basis and was integrated into the Ministries of Health visualization platform in the form of heat maps, where darker regions indicated regions with a higher chance of finding asymptomatic cases. The graphic interface allowed filtering by day or by county so as to help with local planning of test drives. After a successful pilot in October 2020, the index became a key component in active screening efforts nationwide starting in November 2020, which imposed a high toll on the research group as we had to train over 100 users from all over the country. Between November 2020 and January 2022, Active screening efforts found about 46,000 asymptomatic cases among over 2 million individuals tested. To estimate the impact of the strategy, we considered the alternative of conducting active screening at random in the population. We found that following the VAX index translated into finding over 20,000 more asymptomatic cases, which ultimately led to about 23,000 adverted infections. 900 fewer ICU hospitalizations and 450 fewer deaths. Bueno, el índice BAC eh, se ha utilizado en múltiples instancias de planificación interna en los equipos, principalmente en los contextos de salas de crisis, de, tanto de las eh, CEREMIS o servicios, y a la vez también en instancias de planificación de los usuarios, de los funcionarios en sus computadores. El índice BAC en particular también ha, ha ayudado mucho a poder eh, compren, ten, tener un abordaje de la comprensión de la pandemia desde el punto de vista de la densidad de casos activos por residencia en conjunto con la movilidad de la población. No basta con solo ver, solamente ver dónde está más activa la enfermedad en el territorio según la densidad, sino también cómo se mueve la, la enfermedad en el territorio, ya que esta enfermedad, como, como ustedes bien saben, hay bastantes casos que se encuentran asintomáticos. Bueno, creemos que los mapas de calor impactaron en la, en la comunidad a nivel regional en dos áreas principalmente. Una, en poder tener un acceso equitativo a todos los macros componentes de la estrategia, testeo, trazabilidad, aislamiento. Y asimismo, eh, permitió también el que el testeo se traduzca en una herramienta de autocuidado identificada por los usuarios y sin duda que el a través de los mapas de calor, el ir priorizando y focalizando en el territorio, los mismos usuarios visualizaron el testeo como una marca registrada de, de prevención y autocuidado durante toda la pandemia. Los mapas de calor se convirtieron en una herramienta muy útil para la evaluación de casos eh, en términos de ubicarlos espacialmente. Eso nos permitía identificar conglomerados de casos y posibles brotes. Una segunda utilidad que le dimos a los mapas de calor tiene que ver con la proyección de futuros casos en términos de eh, los sectores en los cuales se estaban eh, presentando eh, los afectados. Y en tercer lugar, la programación de puntos de búsqueda activa de casos que nos permitía programar esos puntos. Los mapas de calor fueron una herramienta fundamental para nosotros para poder focalizar los operativos de búsqueda activa en aquellos lugares con mayor incidencia epidemiológica. Nosotros hicimos una eh, evaluación exhaustiva de la información que ellos nos iban o, otorgando, el cual se complementaba con la información entregada en las investigaciones epidemiológicas que se recababan en el centro de trazabilidad de nuestra Ceremi. By late 2020, it was clear that vaccine rollout would be central in most countries' strategies to contain the pandemic but it was also clear that vaccine supply was uncertain. Chile quickly provisioned a significant amount of the inactivated virus vaccine Sinovac. However, it did not have priority access to large volumes of messenger RNA, such as Pfizer, or viral vector, such as AstraZeneca vaccines. The government, therefore, opted for a rollout strategy that would combine the use of vaccines with different technologies. This quickly made Chile one of the global leaders in vaccination coverage, with about 75% of its population vaccinated with Sinovac. Since the Chilean vaccination strategy was unique, health authorities could not rely on international studies on vaccine immunological response and protection. Thus, the country needed its own system to dynamically monitor effectiveness of the different vaccines. 
time was of the essence. The Ministry of Health had provisioned thousands of rapid-to-use COVID-19 antibody detection tests, initially considered but subsequently discarded for individual use. How could we use these tests in a reliably, methodologically sound manner? The engineers had generated a mobile phone-based mobility program, together with partners from industry, which reliably allowed to identify geographic spots in a given city, a main plaza, for example, visited daily by individuals coming from most, if not all, localities within the city. These testing stations were selected using integrated programming, so as to ensure representativity. This innovative critical step provided population representativity using just a few locations per city, allowing implementation of the study in record time. The study was simple, but complex at the same time, inviting, inviting people passing by to provide a finger stick, sample, and answer a validated questionnaire applied online. Protocol consents and study materials were generated in record time, as were ethical committee presentations and approvals. The team of the medical school designed the clinical study and the HMO team implemented the sites throughout Chile. Importantly, all teams actively collaborated in communications, training, and study implementation. We were thus able to determine COVID IgG positivity among individuals throughout the country, whether vaccinated with one or other vaccine or not vaccinated at the time of their fingerprint as well as the time interval between their last vaccination and IgG detection. Our findings prove relevant not only for Chile, but for the world, as reflected by the acceptance of our study by the prestigious journal, The Lancet Infectious Diseases. In brief, we showed that by July 2021, 12 months after the first wave, near 20% of our population was COVID-19 positive, roughly doubling the figures provided by case detections. We were able to show in a comparative manner for the first time in your 60,000 participants that Sinovac and Pfizer vaccines provide a robust immune response by two weeks after the second dose. But the positivity declined significantly for Sinovac within six months, a decline which was less pronounced for Pfizer recipients. This data support the strategy of a third dose for Sinovac recipients in Chile, a strategy now implemented worldwide for most vaccines. And we have continued. We needed to know how good were booster doses. We have further pricked over 10,000 additional fingers, now of Sinovac primary recipients receiving a third dose, either with Sinovac or Pfizer, as part of our national strategy. And fair enough, we observed that COVID-19 IgG positivity increased significantly, and that this increase is more robust when the third dose is with the Pfizer vaccine. And now heterologous vaccination is the policy in Chile. I would like to finalize by stating that our experience and learnings should serve as a guide for improved approaches towards potential new future situations as lived through this hazardous pandemic. Interdisciplinary and institutional collaboration implemented in a timely manner, focusing on national needs based more on positive attitudes than significant funding can have a highly beneficial impact for our people. An estimation of the impact of the early adoption of booster doses showed that it led to 29,000 fewer infections, about 1,000 fewer ICU hospitalizations, and 1,000 fewer deaths. Nuestro desafío era que pudiésemos instalar 29 unidades de testeo a lo largo del país, y esto era ocupando la red eh, asistencial que tenemos eh, a través del Ministerio de Salud a fines de abril ya teníamos 29 direcciones de servicio o los puntos que queríamos testear a lo largo del país instalados y pudimos recabar prontamente información valiosa que permitió en las primeras semanas de julio levantar información y hacer análisis de resultados con sobre 70.000 personas participantes que en forma voluntaria firmaron su consentimiento de poder ingresar al estudio. Y también pudimos diferenciar el efecto de cada vacuna y también de otras variables que necesitábamos analizar dependiendo de la población que estábamos viendo, ya sea del norte, del centro o del sur del país. The project achieved innovation excellence, which is remarkable considering the pressing conditions under which it was developed. 
Given the urgency and the stakes, there was no time for a minimum viable product that could be iterated and improved. Our team built a reliable system that could support proactive decision-making from the get-go in a record amount of time. Our project pipeline presents great transportability opportunities for other diseases, but that also extend well beyond those settings. In fact, the mobility data and the integer programming formulations produced have many future public and private applications related to diverse resource allocation problems across cities, including the location of poll stations, DMV, and voting offices. Not only did our project build world-class transferable technology, it also created cutting-edge science in the fields of operations research and analytics. Last year, we pioneered a PhD course on COVID analytics jointly given by Colombian Stanford universities, showcasing some of the best work done in the area worldwide, in which our initiatives were presented as leading examples of top-notch research having real-world practical impact. Further, our project involved two doctoral dissertations, several other master theses, and resulted in various academic publications in the very best journals in operations research and related disciplines. During the COVID crisis, the alliance between the Ministry of Health, Ministry of Science, Institute of Engineering Systems, named ESI, and the telecommunications company, Entel, were essential for the control of the pandemic since they developed innovative methodologies and tools at work to contain the pandemic. One of the most important strategies was the development of heat maps. They were based on mobility data from the main Chilean cities. In this work, analytics played a major role. It was thanks to this tool developed by ESI that we as health authorities were able to establish the busiest places in Chilean cities in order to cross it with positive COVID cases, allowing them to focus on the active search for cases. The success of this work was thanks to the so-called triple helix innovation, university, industry, government relations. The three parties were represented by authorities from the Chilean Health Ministry, EC Academics, and the private sector by the telecommunications company Entel. These sectors worked in coordination during the worst moments of the pandemic in Chile. This experience could be used in the next stages of the pandemic in Chile by geolocating the areas of greatest human interaction in Chilean cities to play health promoters or health advertising on those corners. This evidence-based decisions-making experience is an example of multiple future uses and public policy that this technology may have. Also, in the face of future health emergencies, such as the uncertainty of new virus, having this experience supported by evidence and science will be essential for the work of health teams. This collaborative work had a strong impact on the response capacity that we have developed as a country to face the pandemic. We're very proud of this nomination. We're proud because it shows that the role of the Ministry of Science, of coordinating the scientific community, promoting science, but also coordinating with the private sector and with government, which is not always easy, can be done. And we showed that we did it. And we showed that we did it in a far away country, which is removed from the centers of science and technology. A young nation which is preparing with a scientific community to tackle future challenges. And we also think that this nomination is a good opportunity to show that Chile can be an example of how science is used in public policy. Le doy la bienvenida a la doctora María Begoña Yarza Sáez. La pandemia nos hizo evidente la necesidad de la ciencia y la analítica en la gestión de las políticas públicas para respaldar de mejor forma la toma de decisiones. La relación entre el gobierno, la academia representada por el Instituto de Sistemas Complejos y el sector privado representado por Entel resultó en una poderosa colaboración. Logró llevar la investigación operativa a la primera línea 
logró interactuar con muchas otras disciplinas como la salud pública y la epidemiología. Esto brindó orientación clara para la planificación de intervenciones no farmacéuticas, la gestión de recursos escasos como las camas críticas, el testeo masivo y eficiente y una mejor comprensión de los efectos de las vacunas a lo largo del tiempo, para poder planificar con anticipación. Nuestro gobierno recién comienza. Estamos muy entusiasmados de continuar con estas colaboraciones, utilizando la ciencia y la analítica para respaldar la toma de decisiones en la pandemia y, ¿por qué no?, en otros desafíos que la salud pública nos indica que debemos enfrentar. Hola, aquí Gabriel Boric, presidente de Chile. Y a través del presente video quiero entregarle todo mi respaldo a todos quienes han trabajado en el proyecto para llevar la ingeniería aplicada a la lucha contra el coronavirus. Lo que ha hecho el Instituto de Sistemas Complejos de la Universidad de Chile es tremendo. Ha sido de un apoyo fundamental que ha salvado vidas y nos ha permitido hacer mejores políticas públicas. Y es por eso que apoyo su postulación al premio Franz Sendelman. Pero no solamente apoyar la postulación a un premio, sino decir de que cuentan con nosotros porque este gobierno va a estar también al servicio de la ciencia. Y haremos políticas públicas en base a antecedentes serios y rigurosos como los que ustedes han construido. Y que, como decía antes, han permitido sortear de mejor manera esta crisis mundial a la cual todos nos hemos visto enfrentados. Así que a todos quienes han trabajado en el proyecto, mis más profundos respetos y sepan de que cuentan con su gobierno. Un abrazo grande. We now close Chile's presentation for the 2022 Franz Edelman Award. We have described and displayed the work of hundreds of people over two years and showed how the collaboration between the government, the Institute, and TEL, and the Medicine Faculty of the University of Chile was able to develop a scientific approach that helps support key decision-making in the Chilean strategy against COVID. The project faced a large number of difficulties. First, it was carried out in possibly one of the most complicated situations of the last decades and where solutions were needed urgently. Second, we needed to communicate and coordinate the efforts of a quite diverse group of people, from engineers, MDs and researchers, to political authorities and healthcare workers on the ground, who were facing huge amounts of stress and were dispersed across the country. Building trust among everyone was fundamental, so that the efforts of a group of people was followed by the next group in the line of work. And third, as we dealt with very delicate information, results had to be communicated with care, something that required further interaction between authorities and scientists and had them both explaining on national media. In fact, media coverage for the project was fast. Importantly, the knowledge we created will not be rendered useless when the pandemic vanishes. Antel and the Institute have already signed a collaboration agreement to further use mobility data for several other applications. While we are exploring how to use the prediction power of the ICU occupancy model during the winter season when influenza and other viruses circulate and when the system is usually quite congested. Our testing strategy, on the other hand, may be used as well for other diseases, something that we are already discussing with public health experts. Finally, and most importantly, the project had a sizable impact on many aspects. It involved the work of hundreds of healthcare workers on the ground tens of scientists and grad students, and dozens of professionals in both ministries and Intel, showing an impressive joint work between government, academia, and the private sector. It enjoyed ample media coverage, and our innovations even led to the publication of no less than four papers in prestigious academic journals, such as Inference Management Science and The Lancet ID. But critically, and as we showed, the project saved millions of dollars, avoided thousands of infections, and in a conservative estimate, it saved more than 2,000 lives. <laughs>